Today's podcast was recorded yesterday. If you want to listen to my podcasts commercial-free the day that I record them, go to shiftradio.com slash premium. It only costs $5 a month. Today's podcast is sponsored by Indeed. Attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend countless hours looking for candidates with the right skills. Start hiring now at indeed.com slash Peter. Offer good for a limited time. Terms and conditions apply. I think today was a very important day in the markets, and I think there's a good chance that we're going to begin the next leg down in the U.S. dollar, the next leg up in gold, and also experience a bear market rally in the U.S. stock market that could take us through the end of the year. We may end up getting that proverbial Santa Claus rally after all, and it may spark a lot of false optimism for that bull trend to continue in 2023. But I think investors are going to end up being substantially disappointed. The rally that we're likely to have in December, it's not just a Santa Claus rally, it's a sucker's rally. And the Grinch may not steal the bull market before Christmas, but I think he will make his appearance early in the new year. And my expectation is that the U.S. stock market will make new lows in 2023 after we get a year-end rally in 2022, especially in some of the tech stocks that have really been beaten down. There could be a short covering rally as well to finish up the year. Potentially, a lot of the funds that have been short these names may want to cover those positions before the end of the year just to book their profits and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year without wanting to risk giving back a lot of those gains in the waning weeks of the year. But I think as 2023 begins to play out, it's not going to look like investors expect. Because what I think sparked the rally in stocks today, and of course the rally in gold and the sell-off in the dollar, was the reaction to Jerome Powell's highly anticipated speech earlier this afternoon And not only did he talk, he also sat down and took some Q&A, not only from the guy who was interviewing him, but he fielded some questions from the audience. I just wish I was in the audience to ask a question because nobody asked the type of tough questions that I would likely ask. But what I thought was so significant about the speech and the Q&A that followed is the way the market reacted to it because Powell spoke as hawkishly as I've ever heard him talk. If you listen to that talk and then you listen to the Q&A, Powell admitted that inflation was still much higher than the Fed anticipated, stubbornly high, and that the Fed was committed to doing whatever it takes to bring inflation back down to 2% and that it's going to take a lot more than the Fed thought. In fact, Powell went on to say that he didn't believe a lot of the private sector forecasts that were predicting a decline in inflation. He just said he didn't believe them. And he acknowledged that prior forecasts had predicted a decline in inflation and that those prior forecasts were wrong. And so he didn't think the current forecasts would fare any better. Powell said that everybody kept expecting things to go back to the way they were, meaning low inflation. The Fed had low inflation for many years. In fact, the Fed thought the problem was not enough inflation, which of course is a good problem to have because it gives the Fed the excuse to create even more. But we don't have that problem anymore as if that was a problem. Now we have a real problem of too much inflation and there's nothing that the Fed could really do about it. Powell seems to be perplexed that we're not going back to the good old days where you printed a lot of money yet consumer prices didn't go up. During those days, you printed a lot of money and stock prices went up. Real estate prices went up. Well, now the inflation has moved from assets to consumer goods, and that is where it's going to stay. It's not going to go back to another bubble. Inflation has now taken hold in the real economy, and this is just the beginning of a long overdue rotation out of financial assets 
into real goods. It's just that Powell doesn't understand this yet because I don't think Powell or any of his comrades over at the FOMC really understand inflation and why it was apparently so low for so long, despite all the quantitative easing. They don't get the fact that they got lucky and they pressed their luck with multiple rounds of quantitative easing. And also part of the reason that inflation wasn't a problem was because we lied about it because we were relying on government manufactured metrics for calculating the effects of inflation, price increases. Those government measures, the official way that we look at consumer prices, as I've been saying, were designed to mask the degree to which inflation was causing prices to go up. And so that lulled the Fed and other central banks who have similar issues into a false sense of complacency that they could keep on creating inflation without that inflation showing up at the supermarket. Instead, it showed up in the stock market where everybody liked it. Well, now it is in the supermarket and pretty much in every market on Main Street. It's not just on Wall Street. And this is going to be a big problem. In fact, I think the problem is already manifesting itself on Main Street this Christmas shopping season. I think the sales that we had on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, while they're talking about record sales, these record sales are not adjusted for inflation. If you do adjust for inflation, it's a decline. But I think the decline is going to get worse as the shopping season unfolds between now and Christmas Eve or whatever it ends. And I think it's going to be a very disappointing shopping season. But I think Main Street's pain could turn into Wall Street's gain, at least between now and the end of the year, as investors start anticipating the pivot. And I think that's what was behind today's rally in the face of Powell's hawkish statements. Because when he kept talking about how stubbornly high inflation was and how the Fed is committed to bringing it back down and how we're going to have to keep on raising rates and that rates are still not high enough to bring inflation down, they need to go higher. But not only do they need to go higher, and probably higher than we thought, but they need to stay there longer than we thought in order to bring inflation down. The only bone that he threw to the doves was acknowledging that the size of the rate hikes can come down, that the next hike in December doesn't have to be 75 basis points. So it could be 50 basis points, but that's not news. The markets had already priced out 75 basis points, Long before today's speech, everybody expects Powell to go 50 basis points in December. So that's nothing new. Yet the market rallied. I think had Powell given this identical speech a month ago, the market would have tanked. The Dow could have been down 500 to 1,000 points, not up 578 points, which is how much it closed higher today, 1.7%. But the Dow was the laggard. Today, the Russell 2000 up 2.6 percent, S&P 500 up 3.1 percent, and the Nasdaq surged by 4.4 percent in the face of a hawkish speech by Jerome Powell. Now, what this is telling me is that the markets are no longer buying what Powell is trying to sell. The markets get that this tough talk is all bark and no bite. Because again, Powell continues to speak about a soft landing. And I believe his resolve to fight inflation is only as strong as the economy. Yes, he will tolerate a soft landing. In his words, that means an increase in unemployment that's not that big. And maybe we have some weakness in the economy, but not a severe recession. So as long as we don't have a big rise in unemployment or a severe recession, he's determined to bring down inflation, except there's no way Powell could succeed with bringing down inflation without causing a massive recession. In fact, not just a recession, but a financial crisis and a surge in unemployment. Now, it's not because high unemployment is necessary to bring down inflation. 
It's just that what you have to do to bring down inflation today would cause a huge spike in unemployment and a crash in the economy because the phony recovery that the U.S. has experienced has all been because of inflation. It's been built on the foundation of inflation. So when you fight inflation, you actually smash that foundation and everything comes crashing down. Had we had a legitimate recovery, we would not be in this predicament. But when you bet the entire economy on inflation, when you have an economy that lives by inflation, then it dies by inflation. And that is what would happen if the Fed actually did what it's going to take to reduce inflation. Because it's not just much higher interest rates. But we need to see a big decline in consumer spending. We need to see a big decline in borrowing to finance spending, and not just on the consumer level, but on the government level. In fact, especially on the government level, we need to see big cuts in government spending. And that's not going to happen. Government spending is increasing, and we're borrowing more money to pay for it. So inflation is not going anywhere but up. But I think the markets now realize that the Fed is just talking. And one of the reasons that I think they realize that is the deluge of bad economic data that came out today. In fact, today was one of the worst days I've seen in months in economic data. And of course, all of this was ignored by Jerome Powell as he talked about this soft landing or softest landing. He is still oblivious to the fact that there is no soft landing. It's not even a landing at all. It's going to be a crash. In fact, ironically, we did get one piece of economic news today that was better than expected, but this one is looking way in the rear view mirror. And this was with Q3 GDP, which surprised me by being positive because earlier in the year, I had expected the GDP in Q3 to be negative. But the only reason it was positive was because two things happened that I didn't anticipate earlier in the year. One was the big oil dump from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and a lot of that oil we exported, and so that reduced our trade deficit because we got all this oil that we didn't have to pump that we were able to sell. Well, there's not an unlimited supply of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, so this is just a temporary boost to our exports, once that reserve runs dry, not only is it going to be a problem for our balance of trade, but that's going to be a big problem if we ever need strategic reserves and we don't have them. But also, that means the next time oil prices really start to move up, the government won't have the ability to try to manipulate the market by selling reserves that it no longer possesses. But also, another factor that I really didn't take into account was the strength of the U.S. dollar and how it impacted our trade deficit in Q3. It resulted in a bigger decline in our import costs because the strong dollar allowed Americans to buy more imports at a lower cost. And all of the growth in Q3 GDP was attributed to trade. And in fact, what was originally reported as up 26 was upwardly revised to up 2.9, and that beat the consensus of 2.7. And if you look at the personal consumption expenditures, that was originally reported as up 1.4, and that was revised to up 1.7. And that, again, was higher than the 1.5 that was expected. So that was the one piece of good news. But again, that's Q3. If you look at the data that came out for Q4, it was all horrific. Normally, when you're hiring for your business, you usually have to make a choice, hire fast or hire well. But now you don't have to choose. You can do both. All you need is Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire 
all in one place. So don't spend countless hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, Assessments, and Virtual Interviews. Hate waiting? Indeed U.S. data shows that over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Indeed helps your star applicants shine even before the interview process begins with over over 135 graded assessment tests they can take in advance from cooking to coding. Just select the skills that matter most to you. With Indeed's assessment, you can pick from over 100 skill tests and then add them to your job posts. That lets you find the candidates with the right skills fast. Best of all, Indeed assessments helps take the stress out of the interview process. Candidates show their skills before the interview, allowing you to dive deeper into talking about what's most important to you and your business. So join the over 3 million businesses worldwide already using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Indeed knows that when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applicants that match your must-have job requirements. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Visit Indeed.com slash Peter to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash Peter. That's Indeed.com slash Peter. Terms and conditions apply. Let me start with the ADP Private Sector Employment Report, which came out early this morning. Of course, we get the official non-farm payroll report from the Department of Labor. We get that report the first Friday of every month, and we will be in December on Friday. And maybe we're finally going to get that bad jobs report that I have been anticipating. And if we do, it's going to accelerate the market trends that we saw today. But the ADP number, which came out this morning, the consensus was for an increase of 200,000 jobs, and that would have been a lower rise than the 239,000 jobs from October. The number that we got was just 127,000 jobs, and not only was that well below the 200,000 consensus, but it was below the low end of the consensus range, which went from a low of 150,000 jobs to a high of 220,000 jobs. So a very disappointing private payroll number, which may not bode well for the government number that we get on Friday. But we also got more bad news on jobs today. We got the JOLTS numbers for October. And there, another disappointing number, the consensus forecast was to see a decline from 10,717,000 job openings, which, by the way, was downwardly revised slightly to 10.687 million. But instead of dropping to 10.5 million, we dropped down to 10.334 million, which was right at the lower end of estimates. But more importantly, if you look beneath the surface at hiring and quits, those numbers were at their lowest level in years. So employers are not hiring and workers are not quitting. And why are workers not quitting? Because their job prospects have diminished and they don't want to risk losing a job because they think they may not be able to get another one or because they need that job so badly. Remember, many people have multiple jobs now because the only way they can make ends meet and put food on the table or pay the utility bills is to have two or three jobs. And they can't even afford to quit one of those jobs if they want to keep their economic necks above water. But it's not just workers who are having problems. It's their employers, too. We got the preliminary read on Q3 corporate profits. The prior quarter, profits were up 7.7%. But in the third quarter, they were only up 1.3%. And again, these numbers are not adjusted for inflation. So real corporate profits were way down if nominal profits were only up 1.3%. And one way for companies to try to restore their profits will be to eliminate workers. And I think you're going to see an increase in layoffs because falling profits means fewer jobs, and that is going to compound the problem in the labor market. We also got quite a few numbers that came out today that will directly subtract from 
Q4 GDP. And I'm convinced that Q4 is going to be another negative quarter. So the first two quarters of the year were negative. We have the one lone positive quarter in Q3. I think not only will Q4 return to a negative quarter, but I think it could be the biggest negative quarter of the year. So ending the year on a low note, even though we may end on a high note in the financial markets, we'll end on a low note in the real economy. And of course, that will be the reason for the rally because it will add to the expectation of the Powell pivot and the false belief that the inflation fight has been won. The reality is the inflation fight has been lost. And that's because investors still incorrectly believe that a weakening economy will also weaken inflation. It won't. It will strengthen inflation. Stagflation is going to get worse. It's going to be a combination of recession and high inflation. And the markets are not prepared for that. The Fed is not prepared for that. Nobody other than me, perhaps, is prepared for that and people who have been following my investment advice. But getting back to these numbers, we got the advanced look at trade deficit in merchandise for the month of October. Now, remember, I said that the reason that we had growth in Q3 was because the trade deficit came down. Well, in October, the trade deficit shot back up, and that is the first month of the fourth quarter. The expectation was for the deficit to actually fall from a slightly downwardly revised $91.9 billion in September to $90.8 billion in October. Instead, the deficit soared in the other direction all the way up to $99 billion, not only blowing away the estimate by 10%, but far exceeding the upper end of the range of estimates, which went from a low of $88.3 billion to a high of $94 billion. So this $99 billion deficit is huge. And in fact, it's even worse when you look at the internals because imports were up 0.9, but exports collapsed 2.6%. So our economy is exporting less, but our consumers are importing more because we keep on spending money to buy stuff that we didn't make. If the Fed is going to succeed in bringing down inflation, we have to stop doing that. We have to stop spending, but we're not. We're spending more as evidenced by the trade deficit, but we're producing less because we're exporting less and importing more. This is bad news for the economy, but it's also going to directly subtract from Q4 GDP. And in fact, look at retail inventories and advanced look on October inventories, and they fell by 0.2. And the prior month, which was in the third quarter, was originally reported as up 0.4. It actually was revised to minus 0.1. So inventories falling is also going to directly subtract from GDP. But why are inventories starting to fall? Because businesses are starting to wise up and they're realizing that their customers are broke and they can't afford to buy. So as they're selling down the inventory they have, they're not restocking it because they know the customers are just not there. In fact, there were some negative comments today coming out of Amazon that supports exactly what I'm saying. But the market just shrugged it off because they were looking at the potential of the Fed throwing in the towel on the inflation fight, given all the weak economic data that was coming out and that investors rightly perceive will cause the Fed to change course. They're wrong in what it's going to do to inflation, but they're right about what's going to happen to the economy and the fact that Powell is going to care more about a collapsing economy than he will high inflation, despite his current rhetoric to the contrary, because he's only talking tough because he thinks the economy can withstand it. But once he realizes that it can't, he's going to be singing a different tune. We also got more weak data on the housing market. What would you expect? We got pending home sales that fell a little bit less than expected. They were down 4.6% on the month. The consensus was for a decline of 5%. And the prior month's decline 
was revised down a bit from 10.2 to 8.7. But the fact of the matter is home sales continue to fall. And in fact, at this point, year over year, the decline in home sales is now an all-time record. We've never seen year-over-year sales fall this much, including the crash in 2007, 2008, when the housing bubble popped. It's already worse than that. But what we haven't seen yet is the collapse in home prices. That's coming. And we haven't seen the surge in inventories of unsold homes. That's coming too. In fact, a lot of people, I believe, are going to put their houses on the market once they see what's happening to the market. They're going to want to get out while they can. The problem is there's going to be a glut of sellers and a lack of qualified buyers because mortgage rates are close to 7%. That is the problem. People can't afford to pay these prices with these interest rates. When interest rates were 3 3 3.5%, people could afford it. I mean, they couldn't afford it, but they could qualify for the mortgage. And based on the low payments, they could swing it. But they can't swing it anymore because they can't get those low payments because those low rates no longer exist. And so the market has to reprice for higher interest rates. And the implications are severe because this is going to be a dramatic decline in home prices. Now, a lot of people are going to initially assume that that means inflation is coming down because real estate prices are going down. No, doesn't mean that at all. Just like stock prices going down doesn't mean inflation is coming down. It just means inflation is moving from financial assets like stocks or real estate to consumer goods. And again, as I've been reiterating on this podcast, housing prices coming down doesn't mean the cost of shelter is going down. It's not. It's going up because what counts is not how much you pay for the house, but what your monthly mortgage payments are after you buy the house. And even if the price of the house is down, if the mortgage interest is higher, the monthly payments on a lower priced home could still be higher due to the increased interest rates. But the mortgage is not the only portion of the shelter. There's insurance, there's maintenance, there's utilities, there's taxes. All of that adds to the cost of home ownership. And all of those prices are going to be going up. So investors will initially be fooled into thinking that falling real estate prices will provide some kind of relief in the CPI, but it won't because shelter costs are going to go up even as real estate prices are coming down. And so that's a one-two punch to the average homeowner because the value of his asset, his home is going down, but the cost of living in that home and the cost of everything else is going up. So as the cost of living rises, your net worth is falling, you're poorer, so you have the reverse wealth effect. Most Americans, their largest asset is their home equity, and their home equity is going to be vanishing. At the same time, their cost of living is going to be surging. This makes everything so much worse, because at least in the past, as consumer prices were rising, but wealth was also rising because of increased real estate prices and more home equity, that took some of the sting out of rising consumer prices because at least you were wealthier. But when your home equity is evaporating because real estate prices are plunging, but the cost of living continues to go up, that compounds the misery because consumers no longer have the increased wealth to help offset the effect of higher prices. They're getting poorer as prices are going up. That really stings. But perhaps the worst economic news of the day, and we had a lot of bad news on the day, I just went over it, was the November Chicago PMI. The consensus was actually for an improvement over September's 45.2, which is a very bad number. Remember, anything below 50 indicates contraction and an economy in recession. The expectation was for an improvement. Instead, the number crashed all the way down to 37.2. Not only was that way below estimates, but way below the most pessimistic estimate on the street because the consensus range 
was from a high of 48 to a low of 45. We got 37.2. The last time we got a number that low, the economy was in the depths of the COVID lockdown. In fact, there has never been a print that low in the Chicago PMI outside of a recession. So in other words, we've never had a, a PMI this bad unless the economy was in recession at the time, which is consistent with what I've been saying. We are in recession right now. Powell is delusional to think we're still going to have a soft landing when we've already crashed, but it's going to get a lot worse because we're going to burst into flames early in 2023. And maybe we're going to see the beginning of that on Friday when we get the non-farm payroll report. Earlier in the podcast, I talked about the big rally we had in the stock market, but I didn't talk about the moves in other financial markets, which I think are more significant with respect to the global macro trends that are going to be playing out in the financial markets overall as well as the economy. One was the U.S. dollar, which tanked across the board, especially in relation to some of the commodity-type growth-oriented currencies like the Australian dollar. But the dollar index fell all the way down to 106 even, and I think it's poised to crash below 105. In fact, November is the weakest month the U.S. dollar has had in 13 years. And I think December could be even weaker than November for a double whammy. In fact, I think it's possible that the dollar index could be so weak in the month of December that it actually ends up negative on the year. Remember, at its high point, the dollar index was almost up 20% intra-year, which was a huge move. But it would be an even huger move if the U.S. dollar surrendered that entire gain in the waning two months of the year. Now, I'd be going way out on a limb to make that forecast, which is why I said I think it's possible. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. In fact, I think it's certainly within the realm of a reasonable possibility. But to finish the year in the red, the dollar index really needs to break below 96. That's 10 full points below where we are right now. So maybe we won't be that weak, but I think we have a shot. We have a better shot of the dollar index ending the year below 100. And why is the dollar going to finish the year off this week? It's because the economy is going to be weakening dramatically and because investors are going to build on their expectations of this PAL pivot because of the weak economy. And it was the anticipation of tighter monetary policy that drove the dollar higher. Well, it's going to be the anticipation of easier policy, of an unwinding of the tightening that is going to drive the dollar lower. And ironically, that is what's going to fuel the next leg up in inflation because a weakening dollar is going to push up consumer prices. So the irony here is that investors believe that the Fed doesn't have to raise rates as much because they believe that inflation is coming down. But the minute the Fed blinks in its inflation fight and indicates that it's not going to have to be as aggressive in fighting it, or the fact that the Fed may have to ease back a bit because of unexpected weakness that is more than the Fed bargained for in the economy, now inflation takes off because it was the strong dollar that was keeping a lid on inflation. It was high, but it would have been even higher, but for the strong dollar. But when the dollar reverses, that's going to add fuel to the inflation fire, and it's going to burn even hotter. And the commodity that's going to most benefit from not only higher inflation, but investors finally accepting the reality that higher inflation is not only here to stay, but it's going to get even higher than it's been. And that is gold rose about $20 an ounce today to close at about $17.70, finishing its best month since July of 2020. Silver, even stronger than gold, rose about 94 cents, closing at $22.17. And the mining stocks also had strong days today. The GDX was up three and a quarter percent. 
and the junior miners, the GDXJ, up 3.6%. The charts here are looking very positive. We've clearly put in bottoms in both gold and gold mining stocks. And if I'm correct about the dollar tanking in December, we're going to have a huge rally in gold and gold mining stocks in December as well. But I think the difference is going to be that gold and gold mining stocks are going to continue their rally in 2023. In fact, I think we're going to see a huge move up in 2023. In contrast, I think the stock market is going to roll over and make new lows, led lower by the tech stocks. There will be some U.S. stocks that will continue to move up, but the broader averages will be weighed down by these overpriced tech stocks that dominate those indexes. Also, a weaker dollar meant higher oil prices, oil rising over $2 a barrel, back above $80 a barrel. I think we finished at about $80.50. I think this correction in oil is over. I am looking for oil prices to rise in the month of December, but to have an even stronger 2023 and to be well above 100 for most of 2023. In fact, there's a good chance that we're going to take out the spike high that we put in immediately after Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. And those high oil prices are going to be another factor weighing down the U.S. economy in 2023. Only the government is going to run out of strategic petroleum reserves, and there's going to be no way to artificially manipulate prices lower. And of course, all of this is going to be fueled by a weakening dollar, which is not only going to be driving up the price of oil, but the price of everything else. At the same time, the U.S. economy is not only sinking into a deep recession, but is potentially in another financial crisis. In fact, not just another crisis, but a crisis worse than the one that we had in 2008, except during 2008, it was impaired with an inflation crisis the way this next one will be. And so that's going to be the worst of both worlds for the Federal Reserve and putting it in an impossible situation where it has to choose between two evils. And as I've said in the past, politically speaking, it's going to choose to fight recession and prop up a sagging economy and try to fight off high unemployment and monetize government debt rather than fighting inflation, which is why this gold bull market is just getting started. But of course, if you're invested in Bitcoin, don't think Bitcoin is going to go along for the ride. Yes, Bitcoin has rallied with the NASDAQ. In fact, as I'm recording this podcast, Bitcoin is back above 17,000. But this is even a bigger sucker's rally than the one we're having in tech stocks. I expect Bitcoin to also roll over, maybe even before the end of the year. I don't know if it's going to wait till 2023, but who knows? Maybe this bear market sucker rally can go a little bit higher. But I think the 20,000 level will be substantial resistance for Bitcoin if it can even get that high. But I think 2023 is going to be the year the air finally comes out of that Bitcoin bubble.